Okay, in this section we're talking about inverse trig functions. So I've got something written underneath here. Before you take a look at that, let's first look at these down here so we can get the basic idea of what an inverse function uh, looks like. Before, in a previous session, we talked about that if you take sine of 30 degrees, sine of 30 is going to equal one half. That was actually from uh, a table we talked about, table of trig values we talked about in a previous session. Well, this down here uh, says exactly the same thing as this, except things are switched around. So here, you put in an angle and you get a value for an answer. The value you get is between negative one and one that you get here. But if you start with that value, that means that you should get an, uh, an, an angle as a result. So it's saying that the angle that goes with this value of one half is going to be 30 degrees. We can get that from our table also. So these two things say exactly the same thing. Uh, they're just written differently. One's, one equals a value, the other one equals an angle. So this is actually what an inverse trig function does. It starts with the value and it always will give you an angle as a result. So again, your inverses are always angles when you do that. So now that we know that, let's take a look now at these, the domain and ranges for each one. So I have each of these indicated here and I have domain and ranges listed for each. So where the domain comes from, it actually goes back to the unit circle because when we talked about the values that you get for sine and cosine, they come directly from the unit circle. Sine was the x value on the unit circle and then sine was the y value off the unit circle. So it makes sense that the values that you put in for x, this would be the value because remember we talked about you're putting a value in instead of an angle. That value would have to be between negative one and one because those are the only types of values you have on your, on your unit circle. So that's what the domain would be for each of these. Now your tangent, uh, look, remembering back what we talked about before, your tangent is the y value over the x value. And because there's many different ways that we can divide these, if I take sine over cosine, I can take uh, a number from here and divide it by a very, very small number. If I divide this by 0.0001, some really small number like that, that means I'm going to end up with a big number as a result. So therefore, because of that, that's why my tangent can be negative infinity to positive infinity because uh, there doesn't matter the way that we, uh, the order in which we divide these can be, can be infinite. So that's why we have that. So that, these are all the domains. Now the ranges would be the type of angle you can get as a result. And the only way to really tell what the range is is by looking at the graphs. So we're not going to be taking a look at the graphs here at this point. Uh, but I'll just tell you that if you did have the graph of inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent, you could read these directly off the graph and this would be the range. The range is going to be the y values uh, that the graph uses. So in this case, uh, what you get as a result, remember that your inverse will always give you an angle as a result. This is what type of angles you can get. So for this, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, so between negative 90 and 90, those are the only type of angles you can get if you have inverse sine. Inverse cosine, the angles that you'll get are only going to be between 0 and pi. And then for inverse tangent, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, the difference here is this one, the endpoints are not included, but they are included on inverse sine. So now that we've talked about uh, all three of these with domain and range, we're going to now take a look at some examples. We just had a look at the definitions for the inverse trig functions. We talked about how we work with them, what the domain and ranges are. So now we're going to take a look at some examples. Here's a, the first three examples we'll look at. And we notice that the values that are on here happen to be values that come off of our table. So I rewrote the, an abbreviated table from what we had before in a previous section because we're going to use this in order to answer these questions. This one is asking us for inverse sine square root of 3 over 2. What that's asking you for is we want to find out what angle for sine goes along and gives us a value of square root of 3 over 2. So on the table itself, I want to look for the value square root of 3 over 2 and I want to see what angle corresponds to that. Here's the sine column. I go down here. Square root of 3 over 2 is there. I want the angle associated with it. That's going to be 60 degrees. So square root of 3 over 2 goes with 60 degrees. That's going to be this one here. Another way of saying that would be if I were to take sine of 60 degrees gives me square root of 3 over 2, but if I start with square root of 3 over 2, that means I'm going to go back to 60 degrees, and that's basically how an inverse works. It's giving you the inverse of the reverse 
of what normally it is here. So that's 60 degrees would be the answer. Now the next one we're gonna do is inverse cosine square root of two over two. Here's the cosine column. We go down to root two over two, that's this one right here. We follow that back over. 45 degrees would be the angle associated to that. That's the answer for part B. For part C, square root of three over three is this one in this column. We're gonna follow that over until you get to the angle. That's gonna be 30 degrees. Now, keep in mind that you could also write all of your answers in terms of radians as well. The question originally didn't specify if we wanted radians or degrees, so you could actually write either one of those as your answer because no matter what, whether you're in radians or degrees, you're still gonna get exactly the same values uh, for all your trig functions there. So it doesn't matter, it, just, it depends on what the question's asking, so make sure you read the directions carefully whether it wants to answer in radians or degrees. Next, we're gonna do inverse cosine 0.7. It says round a radian answer, so they want the answer in radians, and they want you to round it to two places. Okay, now this 0.7 does not appear on our table at all there, so because it doesn't appear on there, we can't use a table instead, we need to use a calculator. So I wanna do the inverse cosine of 0.7. Now on your calculator, if you look above the cosine key on your calculator, you should see one that has a little negative one there. And I keep in mind that the little negative one here does not mean one divided by cosine, does not mean that at all. This is the notation we're using to indicate an inverse. So if you see that on your calculator, that's the correct one. It's the one right above your uh, cosine button. You wanna do that with 0.7. Now you wanna make sure your calculator is in radian mode. If it's not, then you're gonna get a completely different answer here. It's asking for a radian answer, so we need to make sure for our calculator is given in radians. So if you do that, your calculator is gonna get 0.79539888, uh, with some more decimals repeating. That's what you should get on your calculator. We're rounding it to two places, which means that we'll just round it to 0 0.80. This is gonna be rounded to two places, but this is the, the number you should get. If you're not getting that number in your calculator, probably your degree is set into a different mode. You wanna make sure it's in the radian mode on your calculator in order to get this one. Let's do another one of those. We're gonna do uh, inverse sine of negative 1.2. Now the problem is if you were to put this into your calculator, what would happen is you're probably gonna get an error on your calculator or maybe it'll say domain, something like that. The reason why this happens is because, remember, going back to the, uh, the, the table we had previously that talked about your domain. The domain is the number, allowable number you're allowed to put in here. So in this case, uh, you can only put numbers in between negative one and one. So this number, negative 1.2, that doesn't fit our domain that we talked about before when we had that table on the board. You can only use values between negative one and one. So because of that, that's why this is not possible. You get an error. Uh, so basically, uh, you would put undefined down here for that one, or you can put uh, no solution, it's not possible. So you have to, again, go back and make sure you have the correct domain. All these, if you were to take these decimal and turn them, change these back into, uh, these two at least, change these back into decimals, you'd find that the values of this and this are definitely gonna be between zero and one, which are values that you, between negative one and one, values that you can actually use. Remember that if you have an inverse tangent, you're allowed to put any number in there you want because your domain there was negative infinity to positive infinity, so it doesn't matter for these, but for A and B, definitely the number that goes inside must only be between negative one and one.